All right, so um, the muscle system. So start a brand new lecture in your notes. That's supposed to be a Y. If you want to call it something, call it muscle system. I should have a one in front of that team, by the way. Off to a good start. All right, so the muscle system. Collectively, there are three different types of muscle tissue when, uh, when you consider the actual organ system known as the muscle system. And you can see examples of all three of them over here. So three types of muscle tissue. In all reality, though, whenever you learn muscle tissue, you typically approach this organ system just the skeletal muscle, and then cardiac muscle and smooth muscle get incorporated into other systems that rely on those types of muscles. So it's obviously cardiac is what we find in the heart, and that gets associated with the circulatory system, and then smooth muscle shows up in a variety of different places from male female reproductive system, urinary system, digestive system, uh, and vasculature of the circulatory system, etc. So we usually deal with the muscle in uh, reference to the actual organ system or organs that uh, it's incorporated in. So I'm going to take that approach. I'm going to introduce kind of all three types of tissue, give you some similarities and differences, and then really the rest of the lecture is going to deal with specifically with um, uh, skeletal muscle and its function. So the three types of tissue, again, skeletal, Skeletal muscle is what helps move the bones. And we need to be able to move bones for things like locomotion, like uh, as I'm walking around in front of the class here, this is locomotion facilitated by my skeletal muscle, but also assists in the breathing process. Skeletal muscle is going to pull on the rib cage to help expand the thoracic cavity to create pressure differences and allow air to flow into my lungs for gas exchange. Smooth muscle, uh, this is going to be found in places like intestines, blood vessels, among other places, the bladder. So this is really muscles that are associated with structures such as intestines or blood, uh, blood vessels, the bladder, certain structures in the reproductive system. All of those are tubes, right? Or at least sort of like a tube. The bladder is more like a, a sac, but it's at least an a, uh, organ that has an, an opening. And we want to regulate the size of that opening. So we primarily are using smooth muscle to regulate the size of our tubes. And we have many different tubes that are found throughout human anatomy. The last type of muscle tissue is cardiac muscle, and this is the muscle that contracts the heart. And you can see examples of all three of them. Individual cells here, and then the tissue shown here on, on further right. Uh, and there are differences. There are also some similarities, and, and we're going to point those out here uh, in, in a little more detail as we move forward here over the next two minutes. So the primary function for, for muscle, regardless of type, skeletal, smooth, or cardiac, is for movement. In all of the examples I've given, skeletal muscle for locomotion and movement of the breathing muscles is movement. Regulating the size of the tube, changing the shape of that tube is movement. Contracting the heart or beating the heart is movement. So the primary function of skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle is just simply for movement of different types. So we call this the primary activity. But muscle is actually going to be also responsible for some other 
um, other physiological things as well. Um, just to break movement up a little bit more before we move on. Voluntary movement is what's under your control. So I want to walk across the room. That's an example of voluntary movement. Uh, we would also refer to this as locomotion. But skeletal muscle and smooth muscle and uh, cardiac muscle can actually be under involuntary control as well. And we call that involuntary movement, and it includes things like beating the heart. You don't have to tell your heart when to beat. You don't have to tell your lungs when to expand and contract, which is a good thing because you would literally be totally uh, dedicated to making your heart beat and keeping your lungs moving in order to live. So these are under voluntary control. Um, and that's called, or I'm sorry, involuntary control, subconscious control, and we just simply are going to refer to that as involuntary movement. So movement is a big, important activity for, uh, for muscle, but muscle is also going to be involved in a couple other places. Temperature control. Whenever you use muscle, in order for those muscles to work, you need to create chemical reactions or you need to utilize chemical reactions. Chemical reactions are never perfect, which means that chemical reaction is not always translated into the mechanics of movement in this case. But it's going to be some heat that's actually released. So as you're moving around, and by the way, your muscles are always constantly at work. Muscle tone, which we'll talk about uh, a little while um, later, probably on Monday or Wednesday of next week. Muscle tone is this idea that the muscle is always sort of contracting and keeping the distance of the muscle optimal. So when you actually need to run or whatever you need to do, this is going to go on for a long time. You can actually do that. And so the muscle is constantly being contracted. They're constantly those chemical reactions are constantly is being produced. That heat can be trapped uh, or captured and is used to help regulate our overall body temperature or the temperatures. Uh, in addition to movement and temperature, your muscle is a metabolically active tissue and we actually store a molecule called glycogen which is related to glucose and so muscle is also an important factor of glucose control and that glucose control uh, is, is really storage of glucose monomers, individual molecules of glucose in this big branch chain molecule called glycogen. And whenever you need to release glucose into the bloodstream and pull it out of this storage of glycogen, we release insulin. Insulin interacts with the skeletal muscle as well as the liver and uh, adipose tissue and releases or helps to mobilize that glucose back into the bloodstream if we need it in other locations within the organism. So three really physiological purposes for muscle. And those common functions are provided by common capabilities. So there are things that all three types of muscle can do. Uh, regardless of the type, whether it's cardiac, skeletal, or smooth. So these common capabilities, excitability, and that just means that, that muscle can be stimulated by signals.
Well, I put a plus sign in there. Cool. So simulated by signals, it also, um, muscle can be uh, contracted, we call that contractibility, and that just simply means that muscle can be shortened. Muscle can be shortened, or muscle can shorten. And then the final common capability is that muscle, after it's been contracted, can relax and can lengthen, which is called relaxability. So relaxability can lengthen after contraction. Now as you're looking at these muscles, and if you look at the individual muscle cell, cardiac skeletal and smooth muscle, um, they have some similarities and some differences. And I just want to point those out real quick. Uh, I'm not going to give you anything for your notes other than just kind of give you the orientation here. So cardiac muscle founded in the heart, you can see that there are these vertical lines and there's a big dot right there, big dots that's nucleus. Cardiac muscle cells have just a single nucleus. They have this kind of amorphous, kind of weird, non-symmetrical shape. And, and each of the ends here, they just butt up next to another, uh, another cardiac muscle cell. So we have these points of attachments. They're called intercalated discs. Those are the points of attachment uh, between individual cardiac muscle cells. And then the vertical lines here that kind of run uh, perpendicular to the length of the cell, those are called striations. And we're going to come back to striations in a little while uh, as we discuss the molecular mechanisms of muscle contraction. Striations are basically uh, uh, appear, they, they are present or uh, have appearance in both cardiac and skeletal muscle because of the way the proteins, the contractile proteins are organized to help shrink or to, uh, to contract the, uh, the, the cells. Skeletal muscle, you'll notice one of the similarities to cardiac muscles that has the striations. One of the differences is that there are multiple nuclei. It's one of our, one of the um, only muscles, no, I'm sorry, only cells that actually has um, uh, many nuclei. That's multi-nucleated. And that means that there are many nucleuses inside, or many nuclei inside of that individual muscle cell. And the, it's from embryogenesis. We start out and we form these things called myoblasts. And these myoblasts all have an individual nucleus, and we end up with multiple myoblasts kind of coming together all in a big line, uh, and they fuse together to form one big cell, all um, incorporating individual nuclei, uh, their individual nuclei into this new cell that's formed that eventually becomes a mature muscle cell. Skeletal muscle, by the way, the cells um, can be very, very long. Quadricep, for some people, there is a pretty tall guy. His quadricep muscle is probably about, I don't know, a meter and a half, or a half a meter, rather. A meter and a half, and a half a meter. And skeletal muscle cells run that entire distance. So normally we think of cells as being very, very small, right? But in reality, they can be really, really long, but it's really, really narrow, and there's nuclei all the way down the length of that cell. Finally, smooth muscle, just a single nucleus, which is similar to the cardiac muscle or different than skeletal muscle, but then no striations. It kind of looks like a fried egg, the smooth muscle cell does. Um, and it's not that there isn't molecular uh, proteins organized for contraction like we have with the striations. It's just that those proteins are organized in a variety of different ways. So the shit, the, the cells of the cardiac muscle and the skeletal muscle contract in just one dimension. Smooth muscle cells actually can contract in a variety of different directions because of the protein and how it's organized throughout, throughout that, that cell. After contraction, so we can lengthen after the contraction. Okay, so we're basically going to leave cardiac and smooth muscle behind at this point, and we're going to begin to 
focus primarily on skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle very important in moving the skeleton. So pulls on the bones are on joints. It helps to facilitate bone movement and skeletal movement. <clears throat> skeletal muscles also provide support and protection of the skeleton. And so we end up with no unwanted movements. You may recognize that as just simply being called postural control. So skeletal muscle moves the skeleton, supports and protects that skeleton, which we would call postural control. So you maintain your posture. And the movements that occur are accomplished in or by relationships. And what I mean by that, every skeletal muscle that you have in your body is going to have a counterpart that does the exact opposite. Bicep causes the muscles of the arm or the arm to flex. The tricep, tricep muscle, tricep brachii, extends that same joint. The elbow joint's flexed by the bicep, extended by the tricep. So that relationship, we actually go ahead and define in, in a, uh, a higher level of detail. So here we have elbow joint, and we're going to undergo flexion and extension, and it's not just the bicep and tricep that are involved, we actually have a number of muscles that are involved. Those muscles that are involved in uh, moving this joint are called a muscle group. And each muscle in a muscle group gets a different, uh, a different name or a different term to represent it. So one of the muscles in here is called the synergist. And it's going to be the synergist, which is the muscle that primarily accomplishes the task. So in the case of the elbow, we would say, OK, what is the muscle group for elbow flexion? So decreasing the angle of the elbow. And the synergist here is actually going to include the biceps muscle contracting to pull up on the bones of the lower arm to flex the elbow. A lot of times there's actually more than one synergist. And in fact, in the case of, um, in the case of uh, elbow flexion, there actually is another mu muscle not shown here called uh, brachialis that also assists in that process or synergizes the elbow flexion process. So the synergist is, is frequently going to be cooperative. It accomplishes the task cooperatively. So the synergist performs the task, and then we have a muscle that opposes the task, which is the antagonist which is a literature word. So the antagonist opposes the task, and it will return the muscle to its original position. So if we flex, we'll return, extend back to the original position. In the case of elbow flexion, that's going to be the tricep. going to return the skeleton to its original state before that initial movement was, um, before that initial movement occurred. So we have the synergist and we have 
the antagonist. Now, in order to move a bone, we have to have a connection from muscle into, um, into the bone. And the attachment is typically achieved through a tendon. In fact, it's always achieved through a tendon. And the tendon has different appearances. So we make attachments to other tissues. And notice I am putting the term other tissues here. I didn't just cross that out. I was trying to underline that. Those other tissues, because most of them are attached to bones. But we actually have a couple different skeletal muscles that are attached to some other tissues that are non-bone tissues, uh, including the, the muscles, the skeletal muscle that control your eye movement. So it's attached to bone on one side, both of the skull, but that muscle also, and there's a couple of them attaching to the tissue of the eye to help us rotate and, and, and move the eye in a variety of different directions. <coughs> so the majority of muscle, skeletal muscle, is attached to bone, hence its name skeletal muscle. And they make this attachment through tendons. But we do have some that are attached to other organs. I gave the example of the eyes. And in fact, many of the muscles that are in the head attaching to non-bone tissue. They attach the bone on one side of the muscle, attach the non-bone tissue on the other side. And these are going to be muscles that help out with facial expression, uh, movement of the eyes, etc. So eye movement and facial expression. Now each of our muscles are going to have two and only two points of attachment. So two and only two points of attachment. So again, back to the elbow joint here, looking specifically at biceps brachii. Uh, there are two bellies or two parts of biceps brachii, that's what we call biceps. You can see that each belly attaches down to uh, the radial bone and then attaches up to two different places on the scapula or the shoulder. So those are my two points of attachment. Um, individual belly of the muscle here, one point of attachment here, one point of attachment here, whereas the other one has its points of attachment here and here. So it's still, even though you could say, oh, there's four points of attachment there, the biceps right there is really can divide up to two individual muscles for observational purposes. So we have those two points of attachment. And we name those two points of attachment. One of them is going to be called the origin. And the origin is going to be attached to the stationary bone. So the bone that doesn't do any moving or shouldn't do any moving. So in this case, it's going to be um, the, uh, the bone markings up here on the scapula. One of them is called the coracoid process. I don't expect you to really remember that. That's pretty in-depth anatomy. So that's the part of the scapula that's not going to move. When I flex my elbow, it's the forearm, the radial bone that's actually moving. So origins up here in the shoulder are attached to the shoulder blade. The 
other uh, other attachments called the insertion, and the insertion is always associated with the moving bone. So in this case, the radial bone. So I've just given you a bunch of different terms and have sort of highlighted some of those terms. Uh, I want to just step back here real quick and hopefully clarify some of this. We're going to take a look now at the process of knee extension. And what I want to do with knee extension is I want to identify our muscle group. And then I also want to identify our attachment points, just to see if everybody is sort of on target here. Does anyone happen to know what muscle actually causes knee extension? So this is knee extension right here, like you're kicking a soccer ball. So it's going to be this muscle right here, right? Yeah, you're going to call it the quadricep. There's really four muscles there. That's why it's the quad. Um, so we're just going to simply refer to it as the quadricep muscle. You can refer to it even as quadriceps femoris. So that's the muscle that's causing the action. So what do I call that? It's a term that I use to describe the muscle that produces the task or that creates the task. So that's my synergist. Okay, good. Now, dealing here with quadriceps femoris, our synergist muscle, we have a tendon that attaches to the hip, and then we have a tendon that attaches to the tibia by way of the patella of the knee. So your kneecap, the tendon actually rides over your kneecap. It attaches into the tibia, which is the bigger bone in the lower limb. So the hip attachment in the process of knee extension what is the hip attachment? What, what the, it's going to be my origin because it's the non-moving part of that motion, the non-moving bone. How about the attachment to the tibia? That would be the insertion. So origin up here, I'll just put that in as O, and insertion down here on the tibia. So when the quadriceps femoris contracts. That contraction pulls the tibia out. You can have that kicking motion. All right, so that's our synergist. Anyone happen to know what our antagonist would be? Even just tell me where it's located. Back of your leg here. Your hands, hamstring. <clears throat> so the hamstring is what opposes that movement of knee extension. So in terms of knee extension, the hamstring is the antagonist. Now, what if we were to flip this and we we're not to talk about knee flexion? So this is the process of knee flexion. Bring that back of your foot up to your butt. So we're going to switch them. So quadriceps morse is now the antagonist. Hamstring is the synergist. Okay, so with that introduction, now I want to take a look here. I'm, Take a look at skeletal muscle organization. And I got a figure here. 
it's pretty loaded up with information, but we're gonna we're gonna work our way through this. So when you look at say biceps brachii, and you can picture this as being biceps brachii that's been dissected out of um, on a cadaver or some other organism. So you have the bone, uh, and maybe this is the attachment on the radial bone. So this would be the radial bone, and then the muscle extends out to the other side of the scalp. If we were to take and meat cleaver this thing and just kind of create a section, this surface here that we can actually see that we're, we're crossing through the muscle, so we call that a cross section. As opposed to going the length, like if I were to kind of fillet it, so to speak, that would be a longitudinal section. So if we look at it in cross section, what you hopefully are seeing here is you see a bunch of individual filaments that are wrapped up into bundles, and then those bundles are wrapped up into one big bundle. Okay? And we're going to talk about each of those levels of organization just here in a minute. A whole muscle is actually an individual organ for the muscle system. Right? So your bicep is an organ, just like your heart is an organ. So whole muscle is the level of the organ. Again, picture that we just pulled the bicep out and we made that cross section. This whole muscle, the whole organ that um, we're talking about here is going to be covered up on the very outside. It's wrapped up in this layer of tissue. It's called the fascia. And the fascia have some pretty specific names. There's going to be three different types of fascia that we find in muscle. The fascia that wraps the whole muscle on the external surface is called the paramecium. So we're covered up by this tissue called, did I say paramecium? I did. Sorry about that. The, the fascia on the very outside is epimesium. So the whole thing is wrapped up in fascia. Very outside is epimesium. Right below the epimesium, we have these individual bundles. And it's those individual bundles that are going to be wrapped up in the paramecium. Talking too fast, apparently. So covered up by fascia, epimesium. And then the next layer of the next layer of organization with these bundles. And they've reflected one of these bundles out. So we're talking about this area here. This is a bundle. And then you have other bundles that have not been kind of pulled out or yanked out of the muscle. So you have each of these bundles. Those bundles can be viewed in cross-section, which is what we're looking at, and they're called fascicles. And that's the same term that's used to describe a bundle of needles on a coniferous tree. So it's just a term that we're using for bundles, bundles of tissue in the muscle fascicles. Now, each of these fascicles is wrapped up in the fascia, and that fascia is the, the paramecium. Now, these bundles or these fascicles, they contain these individual filaments here that are referred to as muscle fibers. So they contain muscle fibers. It's the muscle fiber, and hopefully you sort of recognize some of the structure that you're seeing here. We've already seen muscle fibers before, but we knew them by another name.
Muscle fibers are the individual muscle cell. And we actually wrap up each of our individual muscle fibers. So there's a cell membrane, all that stuff. The cell is there, but then we wrap the whole cell, including the cell membrane, up in a third fas uh, fascia, which is called the endomesium. Now these three different layers of fascia, epi on the outside, peri, around the fascicle, and endo uh, around the, the individual muscle fiber, all of those tissues, they converge at the very end, and this is what actually begins to form the tendon. So the fascia converge at the end to form our tendon. And what that means is you have that tough tissue, the fascia, that's associated with every single level of the uh, muscles, the muscle itself, that are going to be attached to the bone. So when we start to contract an individual muscle cell, that individual muscle cell pulls on the endomesium. And then the endomesium begins to pull on the paramesium within that uh, the, uh, fascicle. And then the uh, epimesium around the whole muscle begins to be pulled on by all of those different paramesiums leading into the tendon. And so every level pulls on the bone. It's not just the whole muscle or the individual cell. Every level of organization is pulling on the bone. So from here, what I'd like to do is I'd like to now jump down to the level of the muscle cell. And I want to deal with that individual muscle cell, again, that we typically refer to as something along the lines of a muscle fiber. Skeletal muscle cell. So what I need you to picture, I'm, I'm, let me go back. So we're taking this individual muscle fiber, and we're going to look at the very end of that muscle fiber in cross-section. And that's what this next picture is illustrating. So don't think about these as being the individual muscle fibers. This is the whole muscle fiber. This is what we were looking at or could see in that previous picture. So as we go down even lower into the subcellular structures, you can see that there are these bundles. And then we take it even a step further, and those bundles are made up of tiny little filaments. Okay? So this is the muscle fiber or the skeletal muscle cell. And all the stuff that you can see there now on the inside is all primarily intracellular structure. So an individual skeletal muscle cell can be anywhere from one millimeter up to including 300 millimeters, which I'll get to you in centimeters is 30 centimeters, which is pretty long. So we're getting close to half a meter. And for some individuals, really tall individuals, they may actually even come close to having some of their muscle cells that are right on that half of half a meter or 50 centimeters. The overall resemblance of a skeletal muscle cell is a long, narrow, tube-like structure. So it's very, very long. 30 centimeters is pretty long. But then it's going to be really, really, really narrow. So we're talking about it, a long, thin tube that is just chocked full of stuff. Now, as I've already hit on, these skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. Okay. 
And those nuclei, you can actually see some of the nuclei in this figure here and here. These are arranged near the surface. And there's a really good reason for that. Uh, one, the, the, the nucleus is where we contain the genetic material. Everything that you're looking in there is primarily protein. Proteins come from genes. Genes are coded in the DNA. DNA is held in the nucleus. So if we have nuclei interspersed throughout the whole muscle cell, we actually have that information that's required relatively close by to rebuild proteins if we have damage or if we have destruction. The other reason that the, the, the nuclei are, are out at the surface rather than towards the middle of the cell is just there's no room for them. There's so much protein and other material pack, packed into the cell that the, the nucleus kind of has to just hang out towards the cell membrane rather than be towards the middle of the cell just because there's no room for it. Does everybody have all of this? You good? Now, the other organelle I'm going to point out here, um, showing three of them here, are mitochondria. Inside of your muscle cell, we have different concentrations of mitochondria. So different concentrations of mitochondria. And the different concentrations of mitochondria are going to be dependent on what type of muscle it is. So this is a stained micrograph of skeletal muscle. Again, it's in cross-section. So what you're looking at here is individual muscle fibers. And you can see there are basically three different colors. Here is my part of my uh, fascicle. Okay, So I can see parts of my fascicles here the bundles. Um, these are vessels, capillaries, and things like that. So I got the three different colors of, um, of uh, muscle, skeletal muscle cells. And those three different colors are associated with the amount of mitochondria that are present. The really dark color, it, it, it's, it's not as clear to you probably, but it's actually a very dark red. It's like a very dark, dark blood red. And then we tend towards kind of the pink color and then the really light rosy pink color. The more mitochondria, the mitochondria give off a red, um, uh, a red hue in their stain. And so they capture this red stain and they give off a whole, whole bunch of red when they're uh, loaded up with mitochondria. And then less mitochondria would give off less of that red appearance. Not that there's no mitochondria here, they're just in much, much lower concentration. Now, mitochondria, do you anyone remember what mitochondria do? They help to generate a molecule called ATP, which is our energy currency in the cell. It's how we actually can cause the muscle to contract. So this difference in mitochondria relates to a difference to generate ATP and how that ATP is generated. Some muscles produce a lot of ATP, but it takes a long time to do that. You should think of that as being endurance. So endurance athletes are going to have muscles uh, that have a high concentration of cells with high concentrations of mitochondria. Power athletes, athletes that need to be able to jump or they may need to be able to hit or whatever the case may be, are going to have muscles that produce a, um, a burst of ATP. They don't produce, produce a large amount of ATP, but they can produce ATP very quick. And so you should think of those to be more along the terms of power athletes. The endurance style athlete is going to have a slow twitch muscle. <coughs> and so these are going to be the cells that are chock full of mitochondria helps to generate ATP. It's a slower rate, so obviously endurance athletes, you know, the sprinter may be able to run 100 meter dash in uh, under 10 seconds for the world record, which is really, really quick. But they can't go much longer than maybe 400 to 600 meters at that high rate of speed. 
Whereas an endurance athlete may be a little bit slower. They may run that same 100 meters in 13 seconds, but they can do it for mile after mile after mile, even beyond the marathon. So slow twitch muscle, very high concentration of mitochondria, and that's associated with its need for lots of ATP to be produced. It's a slower amount of ATP, but it can produce a lot of ATP for a long time. And this equates to the ability to sustain contraction for a prolonged period of time, albeit it'll be a weaker contraction. On the other end of the spectrum, which are these really light colored cells, we're going to have fast twitch muscles, which will be the power muscle. Now, they have a much lower concentration of mitochondria. And the reason that they have a lower concentration of mitochondria is because ATP is no longer really be preferentially produced in the mitochondria. It's being produced by a biochemical pathway that's uh, located in the cytoplasm outside in the of the um, outside of the mitochondria in the cell in the solution of the cell. And so these muscles use alternative energy sources, and they can generate large amounts of ATP in a short amount of time, but they can't do it for a long time. So it's very powerful, but it is fatigable. So the muscle goes through that high rate of fatigue, and we can only last for a short amount of time, maybe up to three to five minutes of sustained muscle contraction, whereas a slow twitch muscle can even contract continuously for days before we have to begin to um, think about fatigue. And that's for obviously some individuals. Now, um, I guess as we shut down here for the morning, yeah, we're going to shut down here for the morning. I don't want you to think that, oh, okay, so I'm a power athlete. So all of my cells are fast twitch muscle. Actually, what we find is there are both types of muscle, fast twitch and slow twitch. There's even an intermediate form that kind of has the, the balance of power and, and endurance. We find that a balance of those types of um, those types of cells in skeletal muscle. So for many of you, I'm, I'm sorry to break the bad news, but many of you probably are not going to be great Olympic athletes ever. Uh, you may be good athletes, but you'll never be the elite, superb athlete that competes in, in places like Olympics and, and World Cup, things like that. You probably have a very even distribution of fast switch and slow switch muscle. Some of you who are maybe good power athletes, decent collegiate power athletes, you might have a shift towards uh, a higher concentration of those fast twitch muscles. Whereas the elite, uh, the elite power athlete, you look, you know, people like you say, well, world's fastest man he has a very high concentration of slow twitch. And then on the other side, a good endurance athlete, you're going to have more of the slow twitch fibers present. A great elite endurance athlete is going to have a lot of those uh, those fibers, um, slow twitch fibers that are going to be present. And really, it's all defined genetically. You get what you have, and either you use it, and if you're a great athlete, you, you use it really, really well, or you're stuck with build their own average. Never going to be anything superb. So maybe you should just really study hard and become a brilliant, a brilliant psychologist or a brilliant medical doctor, or a brilliant scientist someday because you're nothing special. <laughs> and on that, we'll come back and at the end of the screen, I'll discuss why you're really, really special. <laughs>